Motoring 93 is brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, one tough motor oil. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service. Trust your car to Midas. This week, Motoring 93 comes from the Sky Dome in Toronto. And you know, since this place opened, they have hosted almost every event imaginable. In fact, officials didn't think there was anything new they could bring in this place. Well, not so. In fact, the first event of 1993 marked the first for Sky Dome. This is the uh, kickoff event for the 1993 USAC National Midget Racing Schedule. It's the first time we, the National Midgets have come to Canada and raced the, in uh, quite some time. Uh, this is a national points race, so a lot of the guys that are here tonight are racing for points for the national championship. Midget racing has played a very important role in motorsports in North America. Few people realize this. Back in the 20s and early 30s, racing was held on big tracks and fairgrounds, and there weren't, wasn't much of it. And in order to see a race, you had to get in your car and go to the state capitol, the fair, state fair, whatever it was. In 1933, the first midget race was held in California, and by late 1934 and early 35, almost every big town in the United States had a midget track because a football field, a playing field, uh, anything could be converted to a midget track. And what happened was auto racing was brought to the people for the first time. Before that, people had to go to the races. Now the races were downtown. And by the time the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, there were almost a thousand midget tracks in the United States. And that was the beginning of the groundswell of popularity that racing enjoys today. The midgets can be thanked for that. I've raced midgets for several years, uh, from like 1983 to 1989 was my last midget race, and and um, I can and go kart race was the last time that I raced uh, the Soviet Union. At that time, it was the Soviet Union and the Canadians um, at two other races in Illinois. So uh, and that was in '89 as well. The thing I came here for is it's got the same promoter, Kerry Caparelli, and I love Toronto, and uh, I didn't have contractual obligations that kept me from doing it. So I'm back in the same midget I used to drive and back racing the go-karts a little bit too so th this will probably be the last time I do it but it's all for fun. The IndyCar drivers that haven't done it you know are definitely missing out on it and Tom Sneva he's sort of going from Indy cars to midgets in a kind of reverse order but um, you know he's having a good time and that's what it's all about and you know the only way I'll really have a good time is if I win them both. Midgets uh, I think are about uh, 68 to 72 inch wheelbase. They weigh about 900 pounds to 1,000 pounds. The uh, cubic inch, uh, like the displacement of the engines is approximately 165 inches. Certain clubs vary with engine style and they, they probably have about 325 horsepower. First time the midgets have been here at the Sky Dome. I look at this track and it doesn't seem to be a straightaway. I mean, tell me about the race. Do you get dizzy or what's, what's the thing? Uh, yeah, you generally don't get dizzy. This is a really small track. I think they say it's a sixth of a mile track and it's a flat track. Basically, it's whatever surface they play baseball or football on. And it's like a um, coated cement. And what they do is they put either brake fluid or uh, coke syrup on the surface. Then they let the race cars go out and it, and it attracts the rubber. And soon, you know, soon you have a track and uh, you don't get really high top speeds because of the smallness of the track. These same race cars uh, race on tracks as big as uh, full mile tracks, you know, like at Phoenix, Arizona. The race cars themselves are capable of straightaway speeds close to 150 miles an hour. And at, at Phoenix, I know the average speed, uh, the track record is well over 125 average. So, I mean, they're very, very fast race cars, but they're limited by the, uh, the small track here. Is it frustrating? It, it is because you have a lot of horsepower and you really, if you have a guy set up, you're underneath another car and you really want to hit the throttle. But if you hit the throttle, you're just going to spin wheel. So you have to use your head and, and use an educated foot. You have to, uh, what they call feather the throttle almost all the time. This is terrific. We could do 30 of these. It was so easy from my perspective, Brad. Uh, just put down a little cola syrup to make the concrete a little sticky, bring in 96, 5,000 pound uh, barriers. 
put them in an oval shape and let them go at it. It's fantastic. That was easy, wasn't it? Real easy. It took us about four hours to set up, and hopefully it'll take us half that to get out. There was a point in time when motorsports was a bunch of hot rodders out there trying to wreck one another, guys with a greasy rag in their hip pocket. That's not the case now. It's an upscale sport, and it's okay to go. A father that told his son 20 years ago they get out of the house and want to be a race driver now pays his tuition in a driving school. Test Drive with Graham Fletcher. This is the 1993 Volkswagen Golf, the third generation of this particular automobile. Now, no ordinary Golf is this vehicle because under the hood is a totally new 1.9 litre turbo diesel, a first for test drive. Now, if you think you're in for a rather mundane ride, stick around because this car has more than a few surprises. Inside, the Golf is well finished. Now, that is if you like a cloth that is textured somewhat like a lint brush. During the test, the fabric on the seats collected more lint than my brush does in a year. That said, the seats are extremely comfortable and provide the type of lumbar, lateral and thigh support that German cars have become famous for, and quite rightly so in my view. This Golf does not come with tilt steering. However, it really doesn't hinder things, because what they've done, they've added a height adjustable chair, meaning you can always find the perfect driving position. The dash is a very simple affair. On the left you'll find a speedo and on the right a clock. There are gauges for both temperature and fuel. In the rear there is enough space to accommodate two in comfort and, if the need arises, three. Our GL tester came with a solid fold down rear seat, complete with a privacy cover to keep those ever present prying eyes off your junk. The only other things to mention are that the radio is situated above the heater controls, a gold star for that one, and that the radio now turns off with the ignition key. This is Volkswagen's new 1.9 litre turbo diesel engine. Now the reason they've turbocharged it is not so much for more power, although it does help in that area. Specifically it's there to improve combustion efficiency. Under load, when you add that extra air, you eliminate a lot of the black smoke. Now the other thing they've done is to add an oxygen catalyst, which works very much like a regular catalytic converter. The combination of the turbo and the oxygen catalyst mean this diesel engine runs a lot cleaner than your average diesel. I have already mentioned how much cleaner this diesel engine actually is, but the numbers speak better than I. Carbon monoxide is reduced by a third and hydrocarbons by over 20% when compared to a conventional diesel engine. The other item of note is that even at temperatures of minus 20 degrees C, I had absolutely no problem starting this car. Now that's something that most diesel owners cannot say. Again, another indication that this is not a diesel from the past, but rather one designed for the future. The real acid test though is whether or not you can live with the smell left on you and your hands after refueling. To coin an English expression, not on your Nelly. I've always stayed away from diesel-powered cars for several reasons, not the least of which they can barely get out of their own way, and they also happen to be incredibly noisy and very smelly. Now on this particular vehicle, the oxidation catalyst gets rid of the smell. They've done a good job of isolating the engine noise from the passenger compartment, and between 60 and 100 kilometers an hour, this thing is actually surprisingly quick. The biggest advantage to running a diesel-powered vehicle is obviously fuel economy. That means that operating costs are, unlike house prices, affordable. For the record, we averaged an astounding 6.9 litres per 100 kilometres, or are you ready for this, 41 miles per gallon. And we achieved that figure with the pedal pressed to the floor of most of the time. If driven judiciously, 50 miles per gallon is not out of the question. In the past, Volkswagens have been renowned for the manner in which they handle, and this third generation Golf is no exception either. Very minimal understeer, very minimal body roll, everything is just hunky-dory. In fact, it's handling the pylon test exceptionally well. The only thing that gives it away is you can hear some diesel engine clatter. Aside from that, everything's wonderful. 
Stopping distances, and I will say this car comes with an outstanding set of brakes, average 116 feet from 80k, and the 0 to 100k time is measured at 13 seconds. Slow, but at least you don't need a calendar. Now the reason for this sluggish off-the-line performance is the rather meager 75 horses. My pet peeve on the Golf is very simple. This car doesn't come with an airbag, even as an option. Now in today's market, where consumers are putting overwhelming emphasis on that particular safety item, it has to hurt sales. The other thing, anybody that doesn't believe in the validity of mud flaps has only got to look at the state of this car. Had they been installed, we would have had a clean car, at least for a portion of test drive. Summing up, this car is easy. This is the best Golf ever. And anybody in the market for a compact four-door that's affordable should have this car on their list. Now, if you happen to operate out of a fixed income or commute very long distances, the turbo diesel engine might be the solution to your problem. Next week on Test Drive, we look at the Taurus SHO. We're back here at the Skydome in Toronto. We're now gonna join a man who I know is a big racing fan. And guess who's here tonight? That very same guy, you recognize him, Bill Gardner, he loves car racing of any kind. And now we're gonna join Bill where I would think he's most comfortable, and that's in the garage. You know, Brad, we were talking about those midget car racing guys. All car racers are used to changing engines on a regular basis. They blow them up all the time. But your regular family car, there's no reason why that engine shouldn't last the entire life of the car if you give it even a reasonable amount of regular maintenance. Now, I'm getting ready to pull an engine from a late model Mercury Topaz that died long before its time. A Topaz is a cheap little car, but it's got a good engine in it, and it will last a long time with a bit of maintenance. Now, this one, there's some question as to whether this thing had more than maybe one oil change in 126,000 kilometers, and it certainly went a heck of a long time because here's what happened to the engine oil. It, it literally turned to sludge and solidified in the engine, and he blew the engine. So we're gonna have to pull this engine out and uh, replace it with a used engine from a wreckers. That's the only financially viable way of resurrecting or fixing this car. Now here's a good point for you to remember. If you're looking at buying a used car, you wanna know if that first guy did any maintenance. Well, one of the best yardsticks of finding out whether or not he did is to shut the engine off, remove that oil fill cap as I've done here, and see what's on the underside of the oil cap. There's that sludge right there in the bottom side of the cap. If you don't see it there, dig around inside the valve cover with a little screwdriver or your finger and see what you come up with. If you come up with sludge like that, you can be sure he didn't do regular oil and filter changes. Now, we've got computers to run the engine, monitor the engine, and fine tune it while we drive. There's no more carburetors to adjust. We don't have to change thermostats anymore. The ignition timing in most cars is preset and in most cases even non-adjustable. There's very little to do, but oil changes and filters are still very important. Inexpensive and simple, some owners can even perform this themselves, but do not neglect it because this is what's going to happen. You can see the engine oil filter from this Topaz. If I dig inside it with a screwdriver, there's actually some more solids. You can see them falling off in clumps off the screwdriver, and that's what happened to the engine oil inside this car. It just absolutely turn to sludge, the engine's ruined. So make sure you're doing regular maintenance, it's not expensive, shop around, there's even some good deals on this. But don't forget it. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 93. He wasn't driving, but Paul Tracy was on hand to take in the midget and go-kart action at the Sky Dome. Unlike John Andretti, Tracy has never driven the midgets, but then again, he had other things on his mind, like this year's Indy kart season. I think, it, you know, last year was a good season for me, you know, good building block, and, uh, you know, it could have been better, it could have been worse, but this year I'm really hoping to come out of the block strong, and I've got the word that I'm doing a full season, so uh, you know, I try to make a run and win in championship and just try to build on what I did at the end of the season last year and, you know, come out you know, qualify near the front and run in the top three and, you know, try to win some races. It's been a couple years doing a lot of testing and a lot of miles and waiting to get the chance. And, you know, it's not like I was pushed into it all of a sudden. So, uh, you know, I've been in the background testing all the time and that's uh, kind of humbling experience when you're out there by yourself and you want to be racing. So, you know, it's, it's going to be good to get a chance to get out there and race every weekend now.
The Detroit Auto Show has become famous in recent years for its concept cars. The Dodge Viper debuted in 1989 as a concept car. The public loved it, and the Viper was released into production in 1992. One of the many concept cars at this year's show was the Prowler, built by Chrysler. The Prowler is uh, another look at a classic American roadster. And of course, this one is inspired by the, the all-American street road. And, and, uh, so we think there's perhaps some interest. The similarity to some of the great 50s American roadsters is unmistakable, but style is where the similarity ends. Well, the chassis uh, is what we started with. As a matter of fact, uh, this has a chassis that goes beyond any uh, concept car we've ever done before. We built the chassis with a, with a Trans Am car builder down in Indianapolis. And uh, uh, when you look at uh, the inboard uh, coilovers and the lever arms that, ex that actuate the front suspension, the, uh, the chrome-only wing strut tubing in the, in the upper and lower control arms, and then what we've done with the suspension in the rear. And, of course, this uses a lot of pieces and components that we've now developed with our new uh, passenger car teams. For example, the powertrain, the engine comes from the, the new LH series of vehicles, and we've taken the cradle, the rear suspension, and the whole module and brought it to the rear and put the transmission in the rear. So it's a very uh, creative use of some of the components that we have, and in this case, it makes a, just a sparkling performance vehicle. Inside, the Prowler is equipped with a complete set of power options, including a fully automated two-piece hardtop that opens and closes with the touch of a button. The Prowler meets all bumper, light, and crash standards right down to the driver's side airbag. Could the Prowler follow the lead of the Viper and move from concept to production? Well, uh, our goal is this is one that we'll be able to ring out out at the handling track at the proving ground. So that's why we built this one and why we built the chassis. And that chassis that you see up there on the wall is, uh, is for real. Meanwhile, Pontiac is excited about its latest concept vehicle. It's called the Salsa. It's billed as three models in one, a convertible, a panel delivery vehicle, and an all-weather hatchback. The Salsa, for those of, uh, those of your audience who are not aware of it, was a concept car that was shown one year ago uh, in the Pontiac exhibit at the opening of the uh, Detroit International uh, Auto Show. We did that car uh, totally in Southern California. Uh, it was conceived and built there. And it was done in response to a request uh, from Pontiac that we create a, uh, an interesting and innovative small family vehicle that would be particularly suited to the West Coast markets, uh, with the idea, of course, that uh, if it would play well in uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, et cetera, it would probably do well everywhere. We took the design of the car quite seriously. And when we say to people that that was our idea on what, a, what an interesting small family car ought to look like, it raises eyebrows. But the truth of the matter is there's no reason why a family car and even an entry-level car shouldn't be that innovative and interesting and filled with original ideas. How hot can it get? This hot. Now Marka research uh, that we've done on the car subsequent to its build uh, has really uh, indicated pretty clearly that uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm out there for a vehicle uh, like that if not that vehicle uh, in particular. So uh, we're excited about it. It's, uh, it's not a dead issue. But I'll tell you, it's very difficult to bring those niche cars to market. I, I'll tell you something, I think we'd sell a lot more of those than most people would imagine. What constitutes a niche anymore? You know, we quit building Fieros when we were selling at a projected 33,000 units a year. Uh, that's coming off two years where the sales of the Fiero exceeded or were in the 100,000 unit uh, area. I think we'd probably kill today for a vehicle that sold 33, 35, 40,000 a year. I have no doubt in my mind at all that uh, a car like the Salsa would sell in those kinds of volumes. Our Midas tip of the week concerns aiming headlamps. I'm sure at one time or another you've all experienced an oncoming car whose headlights absolutely blinded you, and that's a case of a car with improperly adjusted headlights. One of the most graphic examples of that 
is if you're driving in a fog, you can actually see the beam path in front of the car. If it's high, low, left or right, you're going to see it quite easily in the fog. But you can't always wait that long to check it, so periodically they should be adjusted. Uh, once a year is a good rule of thumb, or if the car is being certified, if you've replaced the lamps, added weight to the car, changed the springs, anything that would change the ride height or attitude of the car, these are all causes for uh, aiming the headlamp. Now, uh, this little apparatus is what, what helps us aim it. We just replace the cups for the different sizes and styles of headlights, including those sloped aerodynamic headlights on many of today's cars. And those three little knobs that you feel on the front of those headlights when you're washing the car, those are the datum points for our aimer to uh, pick up the, the headlight. And uh, keep in mind, this particular car that we've used for the demonstration is up on stands, but of course a prerequisite for doing this job, the car must be dead level with the tires inflated properly. That's your Midas tip of the week. Nice new car, eh? And here's the infamous sticker with the base price and all these options. And what's this? Destination and delivery, $775. I'll talk more about these when I come back in Kenzie's Corner. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. Nobody pays list price for a car. You either haggle or you go to a no-dicker dealer who does the discounting for you. But do you think that's the number you write on your check? In your dreams. First of all, you've got provincial sales tax, depending on the province you live in, and the beloved GST. I hope you're smart enough not to pay for fabric sealants and paint protectors. You can get those things much cheaper in the aftermarket. But there are a couple of little entries down here at the bottom which really get me upset. The first one is freight. Now, this is like going into Sears and buying a toaster for $40 and having the guy say, well, that'll be an extra $3 to truck the thing in from the factory. Come on, if it has to be shipped to the dealer, it should be part of the cost of the car. Now, the domestic car makers have what they call equalized freight. This means if you buy a Buick in Oshawa four blocks from the factory, or you buy the same car in Dawson Creek 4,000 miles away, you still pay $400 to freight the car. Most importers have a graduated scale depending on the exact amount of distance they have to ship the car. And there's another little entry on here which is really cute. This is a road game if I've ever seen one. It's called pre-delivery inspection. Now the car dealer walks around the car, counts the tires, and when he gets to four, the car's on the road. What else should he have to do if the car's been built right in the first place? And for this he gets three, four, five hundred dollars. Now I'm not saying car dealers don't deserve to make a profit. They have huge investments in their facilities, they hire a lot of people. But if they have to make this amount of money on the car, build it into the price of the car. Don't sneak it in at the bottom of the invoice someplace. Now a couple of efforts have been made to try and do this, but if that raises the list price of a car, it makes a car uncompetitive in today's very difficult market. So maybe we're going to have to get the government to legislate everybody into compliance. The government? What am I saying? I'm Jim Kenzie. As we mentioned earlier, although these midget cars have raced in other parts of Canada, it was their first visit to Toronto. Well, after this evening, the feeling is it will not be their last. That's it for now. We'll see you next week for more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Motoring 93 has been brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, one tough motor oil. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension and steering service, Trust your car to Midas.